Hi there, and welcome to Biostatistics for the Rest of Us channel. Today we will be talking about how to determine the number of classes or groups when grouping numerical data. So anytime you collect numerical data during research, we all know that we can summarize the data using measures of central tendency and its corresponding measures of dispersion. For the measures of central tendency, we know we can use the mean, median, and mode, right? While for the measures of dispersion, we all know that variance, um, standard deviation, and interquartile range are also commonly used. This is, however, not enough to represent all numeric data. You can further summarize and get insights from the data by grouping the data and putting it into categories called classes. And then you go ahead to report the grouped frequency as well as the percentages. Now, deciding how many classes and the class intervals to use for grouping data is usually a daunting task for most new researchers. In this lesson, we are going to focus on how to determine the number of classes or groups when categorizing numeric data. In another lesson, we are going to be discussing how to determine the class intervals. Now, although there are no hard and fast rules, the choice about the number of classes mainly depends upon four major factors. The total frequency, meaning the total number of data points. The nature of the data, meaning how large the values are and how spread out they are from each other. The accuracy that the researcher is aiming for in his results, that's the level of accuracy. And finally, the ease of computing other statistical measures. Now let's explain each of these points. For the total frequency, that's the total number of observations in the distribution. Now, the higher the number of observations, the higher the number of classes that will be required to represent the data properly. So consider these two data sets, which represent the number of clinic visits per year. The first one is from 14 individuals in one clinic, and then the second one is from 40 individuals in another clinic. Which one of them should have a higher number of classes when we group this data? Yes, you're correct. This one. Yeah, because this one has higher number of observations. So maybe if we categorize this into two groups, the other can go into as much as even five groups. So what we're saying here is remember that the higher the number of observations, the higher the number of classes that will be required to represent your data properly. Next off, is the nature of the data. This simply means the size or magnitude of the values of the data points. Now, if the data values are very large and widely spaced apart, this will affect the number of groups that you will need to form. And so consider these two data sets. The first one has small data values, as you can see they are under 10 while the other has large data values um, we can see here one even has 312 okay and it also has widely spaced values so which do you think should have more groups if we're categorizing into groups well yes you guessed right again the second one so generally remember this the larger the data values the higher the number of groups that will be needed to represent your data properly the third factor to be considered is the accuracy that you are aiming at for your results now, generally, as the number of classes increase, the more the accuracy of the results, at least to a certain extent. So let's consider this data from 40 individuals. If we decide to group it first into two groups in one instance and three groups on the other instance, which one do you think will give a better summary of the data? Well, you guessed right again. You can see that for the first one where we had just two groups, a lot of data points can be found in the first group. See here, we have 27 out of 40. But when we made it into three groups, you can see that our data points to an extent evens out. So we have 12, 15, and 13. Now, what you need to understand here is smaller number of classes give a less accurate representation of the summary. And this leads to something statisticians call grouping error. Now, anytime you group numerical data, you are prone to introducing an error called grouping error. Now, this is the error introduced into a set of statistical data when the data is grouped into classes. So ideally, grouping assumes that there is a uniform distribution of the data values around the midpoint of each class or group. And this assumption may not always be true. So grouping error can be reduced by increasing the number of groups, which will invariably narrow the class intervals. Now, if you want to learn more about grouping error, then check out the link popping up in the right upper corner of the screen or in the description of this video.
The last factor to be considered here is the ease of computation of the various descriptive measures of the frequency distribution, such as mean and variance. Now, because the more the number of classes, the more difficult it is to compute these measures by hand. So if you had just two classes compared to five classes, which one do you think will be easier to compute the mean of the group data? Well, you're right again. The second one will be more difficult, right? Because you will have to do the computation for five classes instead of two classes. So remember here, the less the number of classes, the easier it is to compute the statistics. So as a researcher, you need to establish a settlement between these two extremes of grouping. The first extreme is grouping with too little detail, while the second is grouping with too much detail. For grouping with too little detail, meaning you group with not enough detail, this is a situation where you have only a few groups, all right? And this is something I call undergrouping. On the other hand, for grouping with too much detail, this is like having too many groups that each observation is almost having its own category. And this is what I call overgrouping. Now, when we come to grouping with not enough details, this usually occurs when you use too few classes. The classification for each group now becomes very wide and not very accurate in the sense that we will have too many frequencies crowded up in a single class and it's just like having the whole data just in one class now this might make some important features and characteristics of the data hidden in those large groups and then this may result in loss of information also when computing descriptive measures for group data like mean and variance ideally Grouping assumes that the data values are uniformly distributed around the midpoint of each class or group. So when we are grouping, we are grouping with the assumption that the data values are distributed uniformly around the midpoint of each group. Okay, so and we use this assumption of mid values of each class to compute some measures like the mean. Now you can check out my video here on how to compute the mean of grouped data. But in a situation when you have too few classes, this basic assumption will no longer be valid. And this will lead to a large grouping error as described earlier. And we always want to minimize the grouping error. Also, generally speaking, the accuracy of the results decreases as the number of classes becomes smaller and smaller. But on the other extreme, when you group with too much detail, this occurs when you categorize the data into too many classes. And this will result in too few frequencies in each class. Uh, this will often also give irregular pattern of the frequencies in each class, thus making the frequency distribution irregular. Moreover, a large number of classes will render the distribution too unwieldy and difficult to handle, thus defeating the very purpose of grouping in the first place, which is to summarize the data. Furthermore, the computational work for further processing the data will unnecessarily become quite tedious and time consuming. And this is without any additional gain in the accuracy of the results. So as a researcher, you should always strike a balance between these two extremes, all right? Though this might seem like a daunting task, but there's good news. Statisticians have helped us with a fairly objective way of coming up with the optimum number of classes to prevent us from going through the hassle of correctly grouping our data. They have done this using a very intuitive rule called the Sturges rule, as well as another simple alternative to the Sturges rule. God willing, in my next video, I will be explaining how to use these to quickly arrive at a reasonable number of groups when grouping your data. In summary, grouping of numerical data is a way of further summarizing and making sense of data. There is no hard and fast rule for obtaining the number of groups. A researcher is expected to avoid extremes, which is undergrouping and or overgrouping. And the Sturges rule helps us to objectively get an optimal number of groups for our data. Alrighty, if you found this video useful, then give this video a thumbs up and share this video with other researchers in order for them to benefit. And if you are new here and you like what you see, then don't forget to subscribe and hit the notification bell icon. This way you get notified with the next video when it drops. In my next video, God willing, I am going to show you how to use Sturge's formula and another alternative to easily determine the number of groups to classify your numeric data. Thank you for watching.
and see you in the next video.